we can go from now. And um, so, um, um, I'm, I'm answering a question for Aiden here. Hold on one second. Okay. All right. So um, this morning we're going to um, talk about, or this weekend we're going to cover, uh, we're going to cover gastrointestinal drugs. Um, we've got about two or three different categories. We have one more week uh, from a standpoint of uh, this course, if I remember correctly. So one more weekend, and the last weekend we're going to um, we'll cover a lot of drugs, uh, just because of the way the categories are. Um, but um, we will go ahead and start with the gastrointestinal drugs. Again, the same format will be um, where we will have four questions at the end of this morning session, four this, at the end of this afternoon session, four in the morning, and then four somewhere mid-afternoon, and then there will be a post-test. So there is no longer any pre-test um, that is required. Um, I do know that several of you um, got the announcement for the 13-week. Judy sent out a comment. They've been trying to, that's an alliance issue. They've been trying to, um, to um, um, take care of and they thought they had it done so I apologize uh, with regard to um, um, to you know for the hassle that causes you I know that is a very then Judy knows it also so I, unfortunately that's an alliance issue that we're having to work through and they are actively working on trying to get it resolved so um, so let's get started we're going to talk about the gastrointestinal drugs um, today these are the drugs um, we're going to review a little bit. There's several slides of, that are review, which will just help, you know, put it there so you don't have to go back and look at your other um, lecture notes. But again, anything in red is, is game for, um, uh, for this, uh, for their exam. Now, and again, I will try to have the exam up no later than Wednesday uh, so that you will have uh, as much time as possible to take the exam. Um, the, um, the issue is, with gastrointestinal drugs, two things. One is that the gastrointestinal system can affect any drug that you, since we take most of the drugs orally, then the gastrointestinal system um, can affect um, the drugs. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that this morning. And um, the um, other thing is um, that um, um, we are then gonna talk about drugs that typically are going to be used to, to address GI drugs. The importance of some of those is simply from the fact that one is that many of your patients are going to be taking these, and secondly, uh, some of these drugs can have some uh, some effects uh, that can affect the central nervous system. The other thing is some of these drugs may affect the drugs that you're giving that you're taking. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, today. Um, so let's go into uh, the first one, and again, this slide is somewhat of a review. Um, so remember that your GI tract, this is directly from the slides I gave you when we were, when you were looking at uh, GI pathophysiology. We talked about the intestinal mucosa, which is really the interface. Um, it's an interface between the, what you're taking in through the GI tract, and it's also a barrier. So not only does it allow, it's the interface in the sense that it um, basically um, uh, is is the is the uh, where the absorption occurs, but it also um, will prevent some things from being absorbed. The other thing, as far as an interface, is that some excretion can occur through there. So we do get rid of some some toxins and waste through the GI um, intestinal mucosa. We know that it's susceptible it's susceptible to be um, to be breached. Um, there can be damage to it. Uh, this can be mechanical damage. This could be due to for example, someone having severe constipation, and um, what happens is that the um, feces becomes impacted and may actually tear the mucosa. Now, that'll, that would occur in the large intestine. The small intestine, um, sometimes if people eat something or ingest something that could actually you know, uh, tear or uh, that, could be, that could be an issue. We can see infection. A lot of people get a lot of GI. Uh, things because we take in a lot of food. You all are aware of the numerous um, public service announcements that are put forward about, you know, for example, um, beef um, being um, uh, or certain food stuff, chicken, beef, that may be uh, 
contaminated with E. coli and things like that. Um, so we see that people can pick up infections, GI infections. Um, we can also have chemical, and probably when we talk about chemical, um, we can talk about people that have excessive gastric um, uh, secretion can result in uh, specifically acid that's going to chemically burn or damage the intestines. Another thing that can happen is basically we do see people that ingest things, children, sometimes people that are trying to commit suicide can ingest uh, toxic chemicals, for example, lie. Um, we have seen individuals, for example, drug abuse uh, people that have uh, made up, tried to synthesize certain drugs like gamma hydroxybutyrate and one of the constituents in that they used to make it is um, like muriatic acid and um, uh, sodium hydroxide. And so if they don't cook the, uh, the street drug correctly, they can have excess of that, which can excess of acid or base, which can um, produce a pretty severe intestinal burn. And again, as I've said, gastric acid, we see a lot of people that have excessive gastric acid excretion, which can result in um, peptic ulcer. So we do see several of the GI drugs will be used. Some of the first ones we'll talk about are gonna be used to treat excessive acid secretion, which can have an impact on the esophagus, um, which can also have an impact on the, um, on the duodenum. So um, excessive gas acid secretion or altered GI motility results in the acid staying, um, um, not being neutralized. And as a result of that, um, you can get a burn when they have the esophageal reflux. Um, you can get also if the, um, if the stomach contents empty into the duodenum and there's not enough um, neutralizing um, uh, solutions that are secreted by the pancreas, that can be an issue. So again, this is, these slides here are just really to remind you of the pathophysiologies. We can see dilations and obstructions, which uh, we are going to use some drugs to treat. Um, obstructions can be, as I've said previously in, this, in, uh, in one of the previous classes, can be tumors, it can be um, rings, esophageal rings. These are um, uh, connective tissue, which basically cause constriction, so the esophagus can't dilate. We can even see individuals that have uh, spasm, and when the GI tract spasms down, then it's going to obstruct. Um, sometimes we can have loss of tone so that the GI tract overly dilates and therefore GI mobility is going to be decreased because if it's overly dilated, it's not going to be, um, be active. Remember that this, the GI tract is, is currently, it undergoes a, a pretty rhythmic common um, movement. So uh, GI tract has got smooth muscle in it. And uh, we see, um, you know, basically we refer to this as peristalsis, which is an intestinal movement that is sort of constantly moving, um, helping to move things through the GI tract. That intestinal movement is going to be mediated by both nerves. Uh, we see more control of the, um, of the uh, GI tract with the cholinergic system than we do with the sympathetic system. And we also see that uh, there's hormonal control. There's uh, a number of GI hormones, which we went through. We talked about pathophysiology that help coordinate and move things through the GI tract. So for example, when you start to think about eating, when lunch starts coming up, you know, in, an hour, in a couple hours or so, um, what's gonna happen is probably the GI tract is going to start moving in anticipation of you getting ready to eat lunch. You're gonna see gastric secretion. Uh, these hormones are going to coordinate the movement. Um, we're going to talk about some drugs probably this afternoon that when people have constipation or have some sort of spasm where movement is not being mediated, that can create some issues. So um, we do see several potential targets for the, um, for the GI tract. And in fact, down the road, we will see, since there's so many issues like associated with GI dysfunction or pathophysiology, we see that there are drugs that are um, being developed to try to target some of these neural and hormonal systems. And again, one of the reasons the GI tract is susceptible to infections and as well as cancers is they're exposed to the carcinogens in food. Things that you take in, things that you take in in water and food 
um, put the GI tract in contact with it. And one of the things is just the normal activity of the GI tract puts tremendous wear and tear on it. And so one of the things that we see is that the intestinal mucosa uh, turns over. So there's um, the cells lining the intestinal mucosa, these epithelial cells, so they wear out and basically they get shed. Uh, your body actually digests those and gets the protein from them. Um, but also rapidly dividing cells are frequently subject to um, uh, losing control. And so this may be another reason why that you see um, carcinogenesis occur um, in, the, um, in the GI tract. Another big thing to be aware of is we have an interface with the GI tract, which means that um, that's where we're going to be observing, I mean, absorbing um, our nutrients and our water and so forth. So as a result of that, since the interface between the tissue and between the GI tract and the blood is occurring, we do see that the GI tract is very, very abundantly um, uh, vascularized. Um, we see that um, because we have a lot of tissue that needs oxygen and nutrients, that's one reason we have a lot of vascular um, vascularization to the GI tract. And the other thing is we're going to need large surface area where that we can absorb and uh, the food goes into the GI tract and gets into the bloodstream. So not only food, but we got to consider, you know, other things such as uh, the drugs that you may be given. But the fact that there is a pretty uh, extensive um, uh, GI tract vascularization means also that um, those vessels, those vascular blood vessels, that's sort of redundant, those blood vessels basically are prone to developing atherosclerosis. We see this creates some of the issues in older people. Um, when you've got atherosclerotic blood vessels, that means that there is going to be a reduction in blood flow. It also means that we can get plaques. You know, we frequently talk about developing plaques and so forth in the heart or in the brain, but those can develop in the GI tract also. Um, as we get older, our blood supply diminishes with age. Um, basically, part of that is because of atherosclerosis, which is blocking some of the blood vessels, um, may be involved with a reduction in cardiac output due to our heart, basically um, um, just getting old and starting to wear out. Um, but we also, because even with even in older people, we still have some pretty good vascularization. And damage to the GI tract can result in bleeding internally. And in fact, we see that intestinal bleeds uh, or GI bleeds, I would use the terms because that includes the stomach as far as, as well as the intestine. GI bleeds um, are very um, significant. They have, a, there's a pretty, I think somebody estimated, I don't know what the recent statistics were in the last three or four years, but there was an estimate that you know, at least 25,000 people die a year due to, to um, GI bleeds. Um, people that use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, ibuprofen, uh, naproxen uh, in particular. Uh, one of the concerns we have with them is basically that um, those substances can uh, result in GI bleeds. That's one of the frequent side effects we see with those drugs. So you get an older person that's got a lot of aches and pains, and what you see is that that individual starts dosing a lot with um, ibuprofen and naproxen. And as a result of dosing, um, what you find out is, is that can uh, that sets up for peptic ulcer. Another thing that's sort of interesting is that the nerves to the GI tract, um, sort of the pain sensors in particular, diminish as you age. And so one of the things we see, especially in older people, is they may develop gastric ulcers. And whereas a younger person would be, uh, they would be pretty painful, some of the older people don't experience the pain. So what we find is some of the older people may actually develop um, significant bleeding that's occurring that they're unaware of because of basically um, they're not feeling the pain of the ulcer. So that's always a concern that we have. So um, we have to be careful because this vascularity, which is very important for the normal function, if it's damaged, it can, for example, if we, 
um, block blood vessels as can result in ischemia. Uh, it can reduce the ability for people to absorb nutrients and may also affect uh, their ability to absorb um, um, drugs. Um, damage to this can cause bleeding, which um, individuals can become anemic. Sometimes when we find individuals that are anemic and we don't know why, one of the first things we suspect is possibly GI bleeding. Does anybody remember the test? Um, so Arnold, you ask, what, was, um, what do I consider old? Um, normally I joke and I tell them, typically what we see is that people use the age of 62 to 65 is considered the age. When you start seeing 65 um, and higher is that's usually what people start talking about old. Some people go down to 60. Um, I always laugh because I'm 64, and so um, I always tell people, you know, when I was um, 40, then old was like 60. Now that I'm 64, um, you know, I'm saying old is 70 or 75. And um, um, on a day like yesterday and today, it's sort of funny because I sort of pride myself that I'm, when I go to martial arts and I'm fighting people that are, um, um, people are, um, you know, 20 years younger than I am. And um, the other, the, and I'm one of the guys that has to dress up in the suits for them to beat up on. There's me and one other guy that um, are sort of the, um, the dummies and the attackers. But I did some stuff the other day, and for the past two days, I've been hobbling on my knee, and I suddenly feel old. You know, I'm feeling like maybe I need a cane, and then my mind starts going right around from that. So, um, uh, Gary, you're correct, is that typically people are saying 64 to 65. In pharmacy, typically, they're going to say 65, although sometimes you'll see some drug dosing may say um, in the elderly and they list 62, but typically it's around 65 um, is what we see. And if you talk about the real old, the oldest of the old, they typically are talking about people 80 or higher. But just like with adolescents, depending on which agency you're with, um, some agencies consider 12-year-old and under children. Um, some individuals, I think CDC is using, um, I think it's using 18 year olds. Uh, and I think they may have gone up to 21. I'm not sure, but the same thing, but, um, it's one of those things where that you, um, um, you know, as people get older, we start getting considered when would I expect some, some of these things occur. We see people in their late fifties, uh, sixties and, uh, that will demonstrate these type of things. So very quickly, basic functions of the GI system, digest food and actually prepare for taking its cells. Realize that the digestion is going to break the foods down initially. We talked about that several months ago. And then even once those molecules, they're broken down where they can be absorbed. And even once they're broken down, we may see that those, um, those molecules basically um, will be transformed even further uh, to either be storage or to um, um, you know, to be converted to some other substance there. Um, we need hydration. Water is where we absorb. Um, you know, people forget sometimes that GI system is where we take in water. Um, it eliminates waste. Um, but, you know, one of the big things that we're going to see is that um, from a standpoint of pharmacology is that um, it's very responsible for, um, you know, drug absorption and excretion. Sometimes we focus primarily on this. Um, from a standpoint of um, being aware that um, um, that that's going to affect a lot of things, um, a lot of different systems. So people that have normal GI systems, um, we are very sometimes it's very predictable. People that have abnormal GI systems, we'll talk about a couple of situations in just a moment, um, can be a problem, can be sometimes um, an issue. Which leads us into this slide here, and one of the things is they look at which is called GI transit time. So from a physiological standpoint, uh, what we see is it, what that's looking at is the time it takes for material, and that material typically from a physiological standpoint, we're talking about food, to actually to, um, to basically go through the GI tract. So you know how far. So when we have an increased GI transit time, uh, one of the things that we worry about is that it's moving through so quickly that we may not be able to get the to to actually get the absorption. 
Um, so with a increased GI transit time, we may see decreased absorption. With a decreased GI transit time, we see increased absorption. So basically it's staying in the GI tract longer. And um, that creates, um, can create some issues. If we move to the pharmacological component, then one of the things that we see is, for example, how does that affect drugs? So, so for example, if we are taking a drug and we've got a, a, a fast GI transit time, the drug can actually go through the GI tract without being completely absorbed. It just passes. Most, remember that most drugs are absorbed in the small intestine, okay? There are some drugs that basically we will see um, have some effects um, that are, show some absorption uh, in the stomach, but the majority of drugs are going to be absorbed in the small intestine. Um, even the ones that show some absorption in the stomach, most of them, the majority of them is, the majority of the drug is going to be absorbed in the, in the small intestine. So one of the things that we find is that um, when we have a decrease in time, we see that there's an increased absorption, but we went into some interest. So for example, one of the concerns we have is that when a drug is going through, since most of them, um, most of them is as they're going through, is what you're looking at is that, um, you want them um, not to be broken down in the stomach. Remember the stomach has got very high acidic environment. And so um, one of the things that you have to worry about is sometimes the drug formulation um, is going to be enteric coated. So that will protect the drug from being broken down in the stomach um, too, too soon or too much. Sometimes we have enteric coating because the drug is very irritating and it can irritate the stomach. So one of the things that we have to worry about is, is this. And Arnold, the things is, is that, yeah, you sometimes think about it. So when you think about increased GI transit time, you're not talking about it going from the GI tract into the blood. You're talking about it going from entering the GI tract to go, leaving the GI tract. So you have to remember that the increased transit time or the transit time is not from the time it enters the GI tract and goes into the blood, it's the time it, from it enters the GI tract to when it leaves the GI tract. And so um, that's gotta be, you know, you gotta sort of get that in mind. But here's, you know, here's two situations that you run into. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Can you think of a condition in which the GI transit time might be altered? Okay, in, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, um, Crohn's disease. Okay, any others? There's a condition known as gastroparesis. Um, gastroparesis is where the, the GI tract um, can sometimes be static and then sometimes it can increase its activity so it can be very erratic. Um, here, how about this one? This is something we're seeing more of that we don't still know all the reasons. What about? People with gastric bypass. Gastric bypass, one of the things that happens here is typically what you're doing is um, with gastric bypass, one of the things that you see is that um, what literally you're doing is sometimes they will um, clamp the stomach so there is a reduced amount, the stomach is, is reduced. Um, in essence, what you're doing is bypass, bypassing some of the volume. And so one of the things would happen is, for example, someone with gastric bypass, would the drug would get to the small intestine quicker. And so one of the concerns would be if we had a drug that was enteric coated, um, it may get to the duodenum, but the enteric coating may not be broken down enough. So one of the concerns you might want to keep in mind is if you have patients that have undergone gastric bypass, is that you may see um, the pharmacokinetics of a drug may be altered. Um, there's been a few studies which they have um, looked at certain drugs um, with regard to this. And um, um, so for example, I think there's been a study, there were some studies done with alcohol and um, people that drank alcohol, what would happen is the alcohol didn't go through the stomach. It went straight, went to the duodenum pretty quickly and um, so it got absorbed quickly. So what they saw was that their, their peak absorption occurred very much occurred quicker in one study 
but it w- it was the time that a person would normally be drunk was reduced mainly because the first part of it was the assumption it was going to the stomach and then to there. So we may see some altered pharmacokinetics. If you have patients with that have undergone gastric bypass, it's something to keep in mind. Um, I mean, simply you would think that, okay, so the drug has to get to the duodenum. So the time to onset would probably be um, uh, less, but that's not always the case. So you have to really just that's a gr- group of patients that you just need to check on the particular drug to see if there is a um, if there's any data on it. Or secondly, is just if you don't have that data, then you just need to monitor that patient. But you would think if it's going to be absorbed, time to onset may be quicker. Um, the other thing is sometimes you might get more side effects because the drug is not being affected by the stomach, or maybe not all of the drug is going to be broken down. Sometimes you may get a subtherapeutic effect if you were giving a drug that had an enteric coating is that there may not be enough exposure to the stomach acid to break down that enteric coating. So just something to think about there. So um, when we look at gastric secretion, which is one of the big issues that we're dealing with, a lot of the things that we treat, uh, for example, peptic ulcer and GERD, um, are dealing with excessive gastric secretion, okay? We know that um, your body starts increasing the um, uh, excretion simply from, um, from that. Let's see, do we have a question? Abdullah, do you have a question? I'm not, if, you're, if you've got one, I'm not hearing you. If you could type it on the chat board, that might help. Okay. So um, what we find is they, um, your body gets ready for uh, digesting food because when you start smelling food, you see food, you uh, even start tasting food, it starts... Um, stimulating the gastric secretions. Well, one of the problems we run into with numerous people is that sometimes that secretion is too much and we get too much secretion. Uh, Sometimes we have individuals that uh, the secretion is normal, um, but their GI tract is not, um, is, is, has some issues where it's not going to be able to handle that. But what we typically are going to see is we're going to get mucus, we're going to get hydrochloric acid, enzymes, hormones, intrinsic factor, remember, is, is necessary for absorption of um, um, uh, vitamin B complex, B12. And um, what we find is that sometimes individuals, um, some individuals basically um, really just secrete too much hydrochloric acid, either the volume, um, so they're secreting too much or they're secreting for longer periods of time than they should. Um, the um, some individuals, the mucus is not being secreted enough. So as a result, the protection between the uh, protection of the GI tract by the mucus is not there. Um, sometimes these hormones that are coordinating flow from one area to the other may be off. And uh, so what happens is that the hormones may move the chyme through um, with a, um, uh, without the next section being ready. So for example, if we don't have enough um, sodium bicarbonate secreted by the pancreas, but in the duodenum, when the, when the acidic chyme goes into the duodenum, then we're going to get an ulcer there. So, and we do see that there are differences, um, that individuals, um, their composition of their gastric juice is going to vary. So we see some, probably some genetics involved there. We do see, um, certain things like, for example, the feel, the taste, and so forth of certain foods um, in your mouth can sometimes alter the uh, the secretion in your um, in your GI tract. So we do see there's a lot of things that can control it, but we do know that there's individuals that basically their main problem is is that for whatever reason is that there is too much of an acidic environment. So either too much acid secretion not enough neutralization, not enough protection, and that can result in a problem. We see your rate of secretion is lowest in the morning, highest in the afternoon and evenings. 
see a lot of people later on in the afternoon and evenings. Um, they're going to be the ones that tend to use more antacids. Uh, we see them a lot more used then. Um, we see secretion, as you would imagine, things that are, uh, it's unpleasant uh, smelling or doesn't taste good. That can um, alter secretion rate, actually can decrease secretion rate. Some people have tried to use negative and reinforcement by having them, you know, foods that they're, um, that someone is, um, um, their favorites is by um, having them, you know, have it put some sort of taste aversion on it or some things. Um, we do know that people that get extremely angry or afraid or in pain, many of those individuals, they lose their appetite. And that's part of that is dealing with reduction in gastric excretion. Now keep in mind with pain patients, we may also see that um, drugs that they may be taking can eventually do that. And we do see that people that get hostile or, or very aggressive, that we do see increased GI secretion. Some people have argued that, um, you know, that's an evolutionary thing that when people get, um, they get that hostile or um, aggression, it would be like an animal that is getting aggressive and um, um, getting ready, you know, like the ultimate predator getting ready to attack anyway. So there's all sorts of theories, theories about that that comes in. So let's get to the pharmacology. So we've gone a while just sort of sending the background, but I think it's important just for you guys to sort of frame it back with the pathophysiology. So one of the major issues that we deal with as far as GI pathophysiologies, as I've said, is that basically we have um, too much of an acidic environment. The acidity is designed to, um, to really um, help digest food. And um, so that creates a problem. Let me get Angela's question before we move on. So um, she stated, client taking metoclopramide acid reflux. The doctor says it will speed up digestion. Um, client has diabetes as well. He takes the medication for mood symptoms, but in the last couple of weeks, um, it is as if he's unmedicated, but has been taking meds normally. If digestion is being changed, could this be having an impact on his mood stabilizer and antidepressant, making them ineffective? Okay. Um, no, it's it's no problem, Angela, answer, because it does, we'll talk about metoclopramide. A couple of things that come into play here. Number one is metoclopramide is actually a phenothiazine. Um, it is actually a neuroleptic drug. Um, they do give metoclopramide, and we'll cover this a little bit more in detail, uh, a little bit later on this weekend, so I'm not going to go in great detail there. But the metoclopramide, um, one of the things uh, when they say speeds up digestion, what metoclopramide actually does is it's called a prokinetic agent, which means it is increasing stimulation. A lot of diabetics, in particular, um, what they get is they develop somewhat of a neuropathy or have an effect on the nerves in the GI tract, so the GI tract doesn't move as well. So metoclopramide is being used for that. Um, the, um, the thing with metoclopramide is it, it does get into the central nervous system. So it could be that that may potentially, um, uh, the, the change in digestion or the change in the metoclopramide induced could have an impact on his mood stabilizer. That's a possibility. But the other thing is, and interestingly, um, a lot of GI docs, um, are, we're not aware that the metoclopramide actually gets into the CNS. My concern would be that possibly some of the changes that he's having may be due to the metoclopramide acting in the blood, excuse me, in the brain. And um, I, would, I would almost think that would be the more likelihood, but it, it, you can't quite rule out that, the, um, that it could be an alteration in digestion. So uh, it could be one of two things. The big thing would be is if you look at metoclopramide, the package insert, you'll see a lot of CNS type actions. And one of the questions may be is metoclopramide is very effective for, the, for treating gastroparesis. And, but one of the things you have to be careful about metoclopramide is um, the individuals, if they're taking metoclopramide, especially longer than, I think it's only approved for three months. Um, most docs have got them on longer. But one of the big things we worry about is people with metoclopramide have actually developed um, tardive dyskinesia. So 
that would that's a concern too. And the risk factors are he's diabetic, and if he's been taking it for more than three months, that would put him at a higher risk for that. But it could be, it could be. I would be concerned that maybe the metoclopramide was producing central effects more so than on the um, gastroparesis. So um, that just give you something there. Okay. Okay, so one of the big things we see is that a lot of the conditions is, that we see treated GI are basically um, due to too much acid, okay? So what we know is, and this is one of the ways that pharmacologically we approach things, is one thing that we do is we sit there and we go, okay, so what causes excessive secretion, acid secretion? So the first thing we look at is basically is we know that there's three primary um, at least three transmitters or hormones that we know that increases in their levels results in increased acid secretion. And when I'm talking about acid secretion, I'm talking about hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid. Okay. So we know acetylcholine. Acetylcholine stimulates muscarinic receptors. It increases uh, GI movement. It increases acid secretion. Uh, gastrin is a hormone which is released locally, and gastrin will increase. Um, for example, when food starts hitting the stomach, uh, your stomach will start releasing gastrin, and that stimulates secretion. It's basically a signal to tell the rest of the GI tract food is here. And we know that histamine does. And we talked a little bit about the antihistamines um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Remember, we talked about the H2 blockers. And so histamine, by stimulating the H2 receptor, can produce um, um, acid secretion. Okay. We also know that um, acid secretion, what turns it off, is we know that there's a hormone called somato, uh, somatostatin. We know that certain prostaglandins um, inhibit acid secretion. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs can cause gastric ulcers, is because prostaglandins actually inhibit secretion. And what does non sterile anti inflammatory drugs do is they block the production of prostaglandins. So that's one mechanism by which we get um, um, damage to the, um, to the GI tract with, um, we get the gastric ulcers with, the, um, uh, with these drugs. Uh, secretin is another hormone, and then we also have uh, gastric inhibitory peptide. Well, when you look at this, um, what we're going to probably find is. The best way pharmacologically is we are going to probably target um, acetylcholine. Let's see if I can get a better color here. So acetylcholine and histamine are going to be two of the major pathways that we're going to try to um, to attack here. Okay. So what do we know about histamine? Let's start with histamine. We've already covered histamine a little bit because we talked about antihistamines. So we do know that histamine is actually in mast cells. That's where most of the time histamine resides, is mast cells. And we do know that mast cells are in the gastric mucosa, okay? Um, one of the things we also know is that when the vagus nerve releases acetylcholine, what it does is it basically will cause histamine to be released from these mast cells, and we know that gastrin stimulates histamine release. So is histamine a good target? Yes, because we find is one, we know that histamine does increase gastric secretion. We know it's doing it because it is actually there with the mast cells, and the mast cells are right there where the gastric mucosa is. Uh, we also know that um, the vagus nerve, when the acetylcholine is released, uh, it causes histamine to be released, and then that histamine then acts on the H2 receptor. And we know gastrin stimulates H2 release, or histamine release. And when the histamine is released, is basically it stimulates the H2 receptor. So when you look at everything, the situation is basically this, is that when histamine is released, the H2 receptor is going to be stimulated, and that increases um, basically gastric secretion. So we get more hydrochloric acid. So it makes sense pharmacologically if we look at the scenario where that um, basically if we can block the effects of histamine and we're going to do that by primarily blocking the H2 receptor. And this uh, 
make sure I got that. Yeah. So this is a sort of a schematic here. Just point out a couple of things of how this occurs. So the bottom of the slide is going to, is going to be the stomach lumen. So that's the interior of the stomach. Okay. So what we find if you go to the top, we find that, uh, for example, gastrin can, can stimulate a receptor. Acetylcholine can stimulate a receptor. Histamine can stimulate a receptor. And the net effect is that they, if you go through the middle of all this, what we find is that the ultimate thing is they will stimulate a, uh, what we call the proton pump, which is a high here is that what the uh, any of these three can, but we also know that acetylcholine can release histamine. We know that gastrin can release histamine. So these can stimulate individually, but they also cause histamine release, and the histamine binds to the H2 receptor. So um, what we're ultimately doing is these receptors will ultimately affect the proton pump. And what the proton pump is, is basically what it's going to do is it's going to pump uh, hydrogen ion, which is a proton, um, it's going, hydrogen ion is going to be in the parietal cell. And so what it does is it actually does an exchange. It pumps hydrogen ion into the lumen of the stomach and um, it exchanges it for potassium. And the other thing is, is that when you get the hydrogen ion, we also have chloride. You can see in the far right of this slide, we get uh, chloride ion brought in here. So when H, hydrogen, and chloride combine, we have hydrochloric acid. So that's how it occurs. But gastrin, acetylcholine, and histamine, all three of those ultimately um, stimulate the proton pump, which means that there's more um, hydrochloric acid that's going to be produced. So we need that hydrochloric acid we need it to digest food. The hydrochloric acid is going to break down proteins and various other components there. So we've got the hydrochloric acid. We need it. But if we're going to use the hydrochloric acid, we need to protect the stomach lining. So the problem is hydrochloric acid does not have a brain, obviously. So hydrochloric acid is basically, um, it's functioning to digest anything it can get to. So we, the stomach is, produces a lot of mucus. And this mucus serves as a protective lining, sort of like a rubber glove, if you will, on the lining of your stomach. And so it allows the food, um, the mucus will mix with the food a little bit, so it helps lubricate the food. But the majority of the mucus is going to be protecting the stomach lining. So the hydrochloric acid can't get in touch with the, um, you know, with the tissue, the stomach tissue. So um, the stomach is designed to have a nice production of mucus. And the other thing the stomach has is the epithelial cells uh, are really tight. So they're ne right next together. So when you have the mucus on top of that and very tight cells, that prevents any hydrochloric acid from getting down uh, to the cells and actually start dissolving them. We also have prostaglandins that are produced, and the prostaglandins stimulate mucus secretions. And in addition, not only do they stimulate more mucus production, but they also will inhibit um, acid secretion, and they also secrete bicarbonate, which is a neutralizer. Now, the bicarbonate is primarily produced down in the small intestine. So our body realizes we got to use hydrochloric acid, and so basically it has a natural protective mechanism there, which allows the body to secrete hydrochloric acid to digest the food, but to keep the body safe, okay, under normal circumstances. So um, what we find here is that if anything causes for that mucus barrier, it's, it's either too thin or, you know, it may be so thin that it doesn't coat all of, the, all of the stomach, then one of the things that happens is the acid can attach, attack the stomach cells and eat through it. I mean, acid, again, can't tell the difference between the roast beef you had versus your stomach, okay? Um, so as long as we have got acid, um, the appropriate concentration, and we have a mucus barrier, we're good. But what we see is over, over time that we get typically this protective mucus barrier um, starts becoming um, inefficient. We find that one, drugs can do it. Aspirin, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, these are things like ibuprofen, naproxen. 
um, those drugs can inhibit the production of mucus, okay? So what you find is that, for example, by blocking the formation of prostaglandins, we don't have the effects, the, the protective effect of the prostaglandins. Um, also remember that the prostaglandins can secrete, help secrete or stimulate secretion of bicarbonate. So that reduces our ability to neutralize that acid. Um, prostaglandins stimulate mucus. And when prostaglandins are low, we get less mucus being stimulated. We get um, less bicarbonate being produced. And that sets up for the acidic environment to attack the stomach. Alcohol is another one. Alcohol, many alcoholics, many people that start drinking, one of the most common things that we see initially is, is a gastritis. So the alcohol is an irritant and the alcohol can um, um, develop a gastritis. So drugs and um, like aspirin and NSAIDs and alcohol can, de can decrease this um, effectiveness of this um, mucus barrier. Um, regurgitated bile, uh, sometimes if we have a, the pyloric sphincter is at the lower end of the stomach and if it is ineffective, then basically what can happen is that you can, um, um, you can, um, the bile basically, remember, is being dumped into the small intestine to help digest fats and everything. Well, if that pyloric sphincter is ineffective, you can get some of that bile fluc gets um, regurgitated back up into the stomach, and then that bile can break down the mucus. And then ischemia. We talked about the necessity of a, a good blood supply, and um, if something interferes with the blood supply, such as a atherosclerotic plaque or vasospasm, what that's going to do is that's going to, in essence, develop ischemia. The tissue's not getting enough um, um, blood and oxygen, and therefore the tissue will um, become more likely to be compromised. Another thing is if we moved out of the stomach and we go down to the small intestine, what we see is um, these, again, throughout the GI tract, we have epithelial cells which are lining the GI tract. And so one of the things that we see is, as I said earlier today, these epithelial cells are constantly being shed. They're being replaced. Um, they're just under so much um, um, pressure and stress from the food moving through on a thing that typically the epithelial cells have a lifespan of about seven days. And those epithelial cells just simply wear out. We sort of shed them into the interior of the GI tract and uh, our body digests them and we actually gain proteins. We sort of sustain that. Um, when we um, are eating well, our normal nutrient intake, because we're bringing in protein and everything, will actually stimulate the epithelial cell production. So we have a good turnover. We're getting rid of the worn out cells and putting new ones there. Um, we do see some drugs can interfere. Um, so Najib, yes, a clot could do it with ischemia. A clot could cause ischemia and um, have the same effect there. So, um, but we do find that certain drugs, um, drugs in particular that are cytotoxic, like chemotherapeutic drugs, or radiation is not a drug, but you know, it is a therapy. And one of the things is those type of drugs target rapidly um, dividing cells uh, or cells that turn over on a, on, a, on a shorter basis. And so that would be a good example of there is that uh, these cytotoxic drugs, they're targeted at, at uh, rapidly dividing cells. And so the epithelial cells, and that's one of the reasons why people undergoing chemotherapy a lot of times have GI problems. And that's because of the damage to these rapidly dividing epithelial cells. We also see when people undergo starvation, those epithelial cells, obviously they're not taking in enough protein. So those cells um, basically are not being replaced once they wear out. The body tries to re regain the protein, but still they, they wear out. We find um, uh, people with vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, again, this is a, you know, a nutrient deficiency can um, result in um, these epithelial cells being um, basically subpar. Um, one of the things that we try to do is we try to look for, you know, one of the things when somebody has GI uh, things, obviously we, we look for symptoms that it may be, may be there. 
Um, one thing is pain. As I said, is when there is damage to the mucosa, that hydrochloric acid will start burning um, the tissue underneath. Um, we also have, remember, we have pepsin and pepsinogen, which is a digestive enzyme in an acidic environment. It'll start digesting it. So one of the things that we see is that um, a sign that somebody may have a GI problem may be pain. Again, in older people, this may not be, um, they can have significant GI effects and not have um, too much pain. Um, people that are vomiting, people that are bleeding, when I say bleeding is that maybe we find that they're anemic um, with a CBC and we're trying to figure out why. There's no noticeable lesion where they're bleeding. In other words, they, they didn't come in with a, you know, an artery cut or something like that. But we look for bleeding either um, when they're vomiting blood or um, where they're getting blood that's coming through the feces. Um, very common thing, which a lot of people get that doesn't necessarily mean gastric disease, but uh, dyspepsia. I mean, basically an upset stomach and indigestion. Um, sometimes that can simply be from eating too fast or eating certain foods. Um, but the other thing is that systemic effects such as anemia. In addition to anemia, we see a lot of people feel sort of fatigued. They may, um, uh, you know, just feel tired all the time, and sometimes they may be developing anemia, may not have. One of the reasons why we typically do a CBC uh, on a routine, because it can pick up uh, potential anemias before, um, uh, you know, before the person's showing a lot of significant effects. Okay, this is a good place to stop uh, for our first break this morning. So um, let's come back at 15 after the hour. And we're going to start talking about drugs you treat um, GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. And there'll be several of which we'll treat. Then we'll go into talking about peptic ulcer and the treatments there. Okay. So we'll come back at um, quarter after the hour. And um, start talking about some of these drugs that are used to, um, to treat these conditions here. <clears throat> So um, when we look at, um, like I said, there's a lot of different um, symptoms that may suggest or may give us an idea of what's going to happen. But one of the very common conditions that we're dealing with to be um, astroesophageal or GERD. Um, and I think as I've told you, if you're looking at the Europeans, they, they refer to this as gourd because they spell esophagus with an O. But um, um, let me see if I can, um, Rebecca, see if I can change that. So um, see if this is going to be any better. I moved the microphone a little bit. Um, the other thing that we may see sometimes is uh, we may have some delay in the uh, response, but we'll sort of keep an eye on it. So with regard to the gastroesophageal reflux, if you think about it, Basically, what we find is that the, um, it's typically where that we're having um, the, um, the contents of the stomach is actually refluxing back up into the esophagus, whereas the stomach has a nice um, uh, mucus barrier and protective barrier, the esophagus, esophagus doesn't. So what literally occurs is basically that when either there is a problem where that um, the esophageal uh, sphincter is not closing or that the contents sometimes remain in the GI tract in the stomach for a longer period of time. That gives it a chance to reflex up. But the net effect is going to be um, that you're getting hydrochloric acid and pepsin and pepsinogen basically trying to digest the esophagus. If that is left untreated for a long period of time, one of the things that can result is basically um, you will get erosion of the esophagus and you can get bleeding that occurs there. So we have a tissue that doesn't have a protective barrier that is being exposed to a highly corrosive uh, substance. So um, what, are, what are the ways that we attack it? Okay, so number one is that there are some non-pharmacological methods. Um, things that we tell people is, um, you know, elevate the head of the bed, so therefore, gravity sort of keeps your, the contents of the stomach in the lower end, not up against, not uh, closer to the, to the esophageal, which is at the top of the stomach. 
Um, we tell people not to eat late at night and, uh, and then lay down because as you lay down, the stomach's contents basically sort of slosh back towards the, um, the esophagus. Um, that's, that's the scientific term of the slosh. Um, we tell people to avoid spicy or very acidic foods. Those are some common things that we, we tell people. But even with those, we see people that either are non-compliant with doing that, or we see people that basically uh, what happens is they are going to, um, they still, that does not relieve, those, those things do not relieve the symptoms. So probably the first line of defense most people go to is going to be antacids. Antacids are readily available. Um, the, um, the antacids actually relieve symptoms um, by not interacting with the, with the receptor, but what they're actually doing, it's just simply a chemical reaction. Um, what you've got is hydrochloric acid and antacids basically mix with the acid and neutralize it, okay? So that's one thing, and that's typically what most people, when they start having indigestion, which a very common sign of GERD is, heartburn or indigestion, they'll reach for antacids. They're available over the counter, and they're pretty effective in general. There's some problems with them we'll talk about. The other things that we see people use, um, antihistamines, the H2 blockers. Um, the antihistamines basically, um, as we talked about earlier about histamines uh, increases secretion, and we see that acetylcholine and gastrin can cause histamine to be released. So if we block the histamine receptor, we talked about these antihistamines um, sometime, um, I think we talked about them last time we met. Um, so they're the H2 blockers. Um, there is a protective agent called sulcrophate, which actually forms like a, uh, a complex over where the ulcer is or where the, um, where the lesion is and protects it sort of like an internal band-aid. And um, the other thing that people use is they use drugs which will stimulate the rate of gastric emptying. So the idea is if I get the, get the substances out of my stomach, uh, the faster I get them out of the stomach, the less chance it's got to reflux. So these are the general um, regimens that we use to try to treat gastroesophageal reflux. We use some of these for treating ulcer also. The big thing is if this is untreated, uh, pretty much what's going to continue, the person's going to be in a lot of pain. You will find that ultimately um, the acid uh, will eat away the esophagus and just erode it and you will get a, um, you can get GI bleeding, which can be potentially life-threatening. My slides was, weren't changing there. The other thing we look at is what's causing it. One of the things, again, we're, when we're using the treatments that we're using it, we're really treating symptoms. We're not treating the disease. And so one of the things that we look for are things that can be actually causing it. We do know that, as I've said numerous times already, this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs um, can, um, this is talking about ulcers. I talked about GERD. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about ulcers because we're gonna use sim similar drugs for these. Uh, if someone's developing the duodenal ulcers, typically what's happening is that the stomach empties too quickly and the food is too, or the chyme is too acidic and the um, pancreas is not producing enough um, neutralizing sodium bicarbonate. Um, we do know that sodium uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs will inhibit prostaglandins and that can contribute to um, the ulcers. It can contribute to um, actually some, somewhat with the, um, the uh, GERD. Uh, we know that smoking stimulates gastric acid secretion, so we try to tell people to quit smoking. Um, Sometimes it's um, something going with the pancreas uh, where it's not secreting enough bicarbonate. And so um, those are all things that, two things happen really. Is one, you elevate the amount of acid in the environment. So you get a more acidic environment. And um, secondly, these act to, um, or can contribute to destroying the epithelial tissue, which then leaves the underlying muscle and uh, allows these things to, to go through. But again, with with GERD, what we have is basically the acid is going up into the esophagus. With the duodenal ulcers, the acid is going too quick into the duodenum, which is the small intestine. So both of these conditions, one tends to be at the 
the uh, upper end of the end of the stomach, the other is at the lower end of the stomach. And look at the treatment for these duodenal ulcers, very similar to what we saw with GERD, okay? Now with GERD, we're not going to do a lot of, I mean, excuse me, with the duodenal ulcers, um, you know, elevating the bed doesn't help. Um, we do try to tell people to, you know, watch their diet, cut down on acidic foods, things like that. But notice what we're doing here is again, we have the same condition, we have hyperacidity, and um, the hyperacidity is going to, it really comes down to, you know, how do we neutralize this hyperacidity, uh, whether it's in the um, esophagus, which is GERD, or we have hyperacidity in the duodenum, which is the peptic ulcer or the duodenal ulcer. So again, one hyperacidity, one thing we can do is neutralize the acid, okay? Primarily in acids. Um, another thing is do something to decrease the acid secretion. So just as I mentioned before, we use antihistamines. Um, third thing is use, uh, put a protective coating. So what this sulcrophate does is it actually um, um, will coat where the ulcer is and allows it to, it's got some other properties, but it basically is going to coat where the ulcer is and allows it to heal. Um, since we know specifically with duodenal ulcers that remember H. pylori, that was the little, um, um, that um, they are, um, um, shoot, um, it's a little bacteria that basically has been found and can cause, and so, one of the things we can do is use antibacterial or the antibiotics. And then the other thing is we can use things to suppress gastric motility. Um, and that would also decrease secretion, and those are the anticholinergics. Rebecca, you asked what names are they, the smooth muscle stimulants? I'm not sure exactly what the drugs that actually will, that are prokinetic type drugs. So, for example, um, the acetylcholine will stimulate it, but the oh, suc sucralate, that is not a, that's not a smooth muscle stimulant. What it actually does is it forms like a band-aid. It forms a coating over the ulcer. And um, so sucralate is, um, it tastes horrible, by the way. Um, but it basically, the best way to describe it is if you've seen, um, when people get cold sores, there's like a, um, a gel. Uh, that you put cold sores that sort of forms like a coating over the thing. Sucrophote is similar to that. And I'll go into the exact mechanism in just a moment. Okay. All right. So when we look at um, ulcers, uh, the other thing we have to look at is, let's say if there's a cause there. Um, one of the things we know is, for example, this is a slide marked in red because um, this will be things that you need to be aware of. Um, so number one is alcohol causes gastric irritation. Gastric irritation ultimately results in breakdown. Aspirin causes gastric irritation. Any substance that causes gastric irritation can break down that mucosal barrier. And um, when doing that, it can be a, um, um, a real, uh, it just sets up for when that interface is broken down, then we get the acid gets down in it and can actually um, and, and you, and that gets into, um, um, to breaking down the, the underlying tissue. Um, and so Rebecca, the rest of your question, the stimulation to increase gastric rate of gastric emptying is those are what we call prokinetic agents. We'll talk about them and I'll just put it here. And, um, They're prokinetic agents. We mentioned metoclopramide is one of them. And I'll talk about a couple of others in just a few minutes. Um, corticosteroids, one of the things that they do is the corticosteroids, a lot of people go on corticosteroids because uh, it suppresses inflammation. But the other thing it does is the corticosteroids can also um, interact to cause the, to reduce the mucosal barrier. You have less mucus being produced. And as a result, people on corticosteroids for long periods of time, one of the things that they will run into is they can develop GI ulcers. So we, one of the things that we've done is we've tried to um, 
reduce the amount of time people are on corticosteroids. Um, when we can use it topically or locally, we do that. Um, I've talked about the NSAIDs uh, already. Uh, potassium chloride sometimes is given orally, uh, for example, as a potassium supplement. That can cause GI irritation. Methotrexate, which is a drug used for um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, and some other things, can actually cause GI bleeding and GI irritation. And then iron. Uh, people that are taking a lot of iron as an iron supplement because they think they're anemic, um, that can actually cause um, esophageal ulceration. And so it's, iron can be very irritating to the GI tract. So anything that produces irritation to the GI tract is potential um, for causing ulcers. And we, most of these drugs, that's one of the concerns. If they do produce GI irritation, that's always it. Aspirin, you know, we've come out with enteric coated aspirin, that helps, but if someone is still taking a lot of aspirin, that can still, that can still create it. Or what they call, um, we have a buffered aspirin, which is not as irritating on the GI tract. So how do we treat this? Let's look at anti-ulcer drugs and we're gonna cover a little bit about the GERD, I'll sort of overlap. So we have antacids, uh, which we're, we're gonna talk about just the next group here. We have anticholinergics, so drugs that are interfered. Typically these are anti-muscarinic. We have the H2 antagonist, which we've already talked about. Prostaglandins, we really don't have any prostaglandins that we use truly for treating anti-ulcer drugs, this has been a potential target. There is a couple of drugs that are prostaglandins, but we really don't see them used for treating ulcers. Uh, the protective agents are gonna be things like sulcrophate. The proton inhibitor is probably the drug of choice. Um, and then we are gonna use the antimicrobials because of the H. pylori. So let's talk about antacids, which a lot of people, you know, you talk to a lot of people that use these, and they think they're really safe, they're over the counter. People buy them, people actually buy them by the case sometimes. Um, so that's a big concern sometimes. If they're using that much antacids, but we have had people come in and buy, you know, into a pharmacy and buy, wanna buy a case of Tums. Um, you know, sometimes I've seen, I saw one guy that came in and bought a case and basically he said, you know, everybody in the office used it. So he was just buying a case to, um, you know, for the office so everybody would have access. I've seen people just like chain smokers or chain antacid users. You know, basically, um, I, you know, before they eat, they start taking an antacid. Um, as soon as they finish eating, they start popping an antacid and probably for the next two or three hours afterwards. And then they may have an hour or two off. And then before the next meal, they start popping an antacid. So what are these? They're basically, we have acids and bases. Uh, these are antacids, so typically that's the bases. So the idea is that when you um, combine a wheat base with an acid, basically it neutralizes it, okay? It gets rid of the acidity and it doesn't turn it into, turns it into what is called a salt, really, and um, the salt is then excreted. So the idea here is the acid we're trying to neutralize is hydrochloric acid. Okay, so a lot of these antacids, you will see they are um, they're sodium, magnesium, calcium, or aluminum. Um, we have gotten away from the sodium chloride um, because a lot of people are have high blood pressure, and so by them using the sodium antacids, basically what we find is that they increase their amount of sodium that can actually raise their blood pressure. And um, we see sometimes a lot of women that have this will use the calcium ones as a calcium supplement. So they're taking enough that they're using, you know, basically uh, a calcium supplement there. So when you take a sodium base and combine it with hydrochloric acid, you get sodium chloride. That actually can be absorbed by the small intestine, so salt. Ultimately, uh, sodium chloride will get in the bloodstream, can raise your blood pressure. Um, a lot of times people prefer what they call divalent ions, which means they have um, a two plus charge or a three plus charge. Um, these divalent ions actually 
they are not as soluble as sodium chloride. So what happens is these um, calcium and magnesium and so forth, they actually will form a carbonate and they precipitate in the bowel and actually just get excreted. So a lot of people prefer those versus sodium chloride. Um, the other thing you can find is that these components of Tums or these components of these antacids, like the calcium, magnesium, aluminum, can also bind up with fatty acids. And when they form with fatty acids, they form uh, what is called a soap, and those are just excreted also. So um, many of these substances will just ultimately combine with some other constituent in the, um, in the GI tract and then be excreted. Uh, sodium chloride is, is sort of the, um, the exception there. Now, the thing that you have to remember is antacids, people say, what people forget is this is not interacting directly with a receptor. This is a chemical reaction that's actually occurring because you've got hydrochloride in the lumen of the stomach, and basically what you've got is the antacids um, and the net effect is that um, um, they neutralize the acid, okay? They don't decrease the secretion of acid. What they're acting on is the acid that's already been secreted. But, key point here, is they may actually increase secretion because what's happening is that the sensors in your, G, in your, in your stomach and everything, decrease the acid, their acid has been stimulated by either by the excessive activity of these nerves or hormones or by the presence of food or whatever. So if you neutralize the acid, the body doesn't think there's enough acid there, so it may actually increase secretion. So one of the things we see sometimes is, although the antacids may relieve the pain by neutralizing acid, they may actually increase the amount of um, acid that's being secreted which means that a person may be, have to continually um, uh, you know, taking more of the drug to try to do that. Um, the mechanism is basically by neutralizing the acid, it decreases the total acid load. That's, that's what we want. Um, that's its therapeutic value. The other thing is when you neutralize the acid, um, the hydrochloric acid, um, you have a um, compound in the GI tract in the stomach called pepsin. And pepsin actually has to um, have a very acidic pH to work. So when you decrease the total acid load, what happens is that the pH changes and pepsin becomes ineffective. So the way these work therapeutically is you're decreasing the amount of hydrochloric acid and secondarily is by decreasing the amount of hydrochloric acid, you change the pH, which means that the enzyme pepsin can't be activated and can't break down things. So not only you're doing that, but it's an issue. Now, Arnold, you ask a question with regard to um, um, aluminum. Um, yes, there is a problem if people are taking a lot of these that aluminum, even with calcium and stuff like that, there are people that can take enough of this that they may have problems. If somebody's using them normally, then, you know, in a normal regular dose and not doing excessively, probably not a problem unless they do have, you know, some sort of kidney dysfunction or something like that. But what most people do, or they're not going to take a lot of it. the ones that would be like chain taking in acids, that would be the biggest concern. All right, so when we look at antacids, uh, one category we're not gonna go into too much is, we do have systemic an antacids. This is for people that um, basically have an acidosis and we really neutralize it. Uh, we're gonna give that systemically, we use sodium bicarbonate. And so um, we use it for two reasons. One is if someone's developed an acidosis, we can um, neutralize the pH by giving sodium bicarbonate. Another thing is sometimes we will use this uh, when somebody is overdosed with certain drugs because what happens is that by giving them sodium bicarbonate, it will cause the urine to become alkaline and that will allow uh, some of these toxins to be excreted through the kidneys. So that's there. You're not going to have to worry about systemic um, antacids. We're going to be looking at more what we call non-systemic 
for treatment of the GI issues. It's non-systemic, which is basically um, focusing on um, sort of a localized, the effects that's going to be localized to the, to the stomach. So the non-systemic, they contain a cation that's poorly absorbed. So we're trying to keep it, you know, in the GI tract. Um, under normal doses, you would not see any alteration in blood pH. You're not going to see any change in urine concentration as far as the pH there. Um, and people can use these long term. Again, one of the biggest concerns we have is that if we see that sometimes they are, uh, they're using them too much, a little too much, we may start seeing an increase. We get sort of the cycle of they use them, the body sort of increases acid secretion, so they use some more. So typically we're hoping that these, or we're anticipating these are not going to be absorbed. And some of the ones that we see, uh, again, you're not going to need to know the, uh, the trade names or anything like that as usual. Uh, for example, there's one that's got aluminum hydroxide and magnesium carbonate. That's Gavis, Gaviscon. Uh, we have aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, and cymethicone. That's Maalox. Um, magnesium hydroxide is milk of magnesia. These are some, um, you know, some common uh, antacids that are used. The thing is that it's a quick chemical reaction, so neutralization is brief. Uh, typically, somebody's going to pop two, three, or four of these uh, over the time period. Um, the other thing that happens with the calcium salts, which tends to be tend to be used more by women that are trying to use this as a form of replacing calcium in addition to affecting indigestion, is sometimes what will happen is that the um, the calcium, the presence of the calcium, is that when it leaves the stomach, so when the antacid has been has neutralized and it leaves the stomach, um, what happens is that um, the calcium can then cause gastrin to be released, which causes a rebound um, secretion of gastric acid. So we don't like to see antacid, uh, calcium salts used uh, in somebody that has a peptic ulcer because of this rebound. Um, what you're going to find is the patient is going to have a product that they prefer. It's one that tastes good to them or is palatable. Uh, it may be that they think is cost effective. In other words, it may be the cheapest. Uh, maybe something one of their friends has recommended, so you will see that. Uh, what you tend to see is most patients will avoid um, any of the sodium ones because especially if they're older people, the concern about the um, sodium um, chloride. Um, we do know that the magnesium and aluminum salts uh, take a little longer to kick in, but they tend to stay for a longer duration. And sometimes you'll see people sort of doubling up. They'll use something that has a faster onset and then use the magnesium and aluminum um, a little bit later on. So the side effects basically is, this gets back to um, Arnold, your question is typically it's very minor that we have. We do see that a person that has renal insufficiency, people that have got pretty bad kidneys, um, basically if you're using calcium, magnesium, or aluminum, um, you could, if they're using a lot of these, get a, a systemic toxicity of that. Um, we do pe find people that are using a lot of the calcium-based ones can develop a hypercalcemia. Uh, they may actually form kidney stones, uh, colliculi. Um, people that are using aluminum based ones, a lot of those, we sometimes, they, they will develop a, a phosphate deficiency. But again, these people that are developing these side effects and these issues typically are overusing these things. I mean, typically are using quite a bit of them. The most common effect that you see is going to be, um, some of them can cause constipation some of them can cause some diarrhea. Again, most of these are not being, a lot of times these uh, ones that bind with soaps or bind with fatty acids can produce um, the diarrhea. That's what we typically see there. But um, most of the time these are, I mean, you know, if it, the biggest thing we used to see with the sodium would people took enough of those in where that they were, their blood pressure would go up. So that was always a concern. But if they are taking and using a lot of these, I mean, literally, you know, multiple packs per day, when I say packs, a roll or whatever it is, multiple situations per day, 
these are there there is i mean we need to be looking at something else i mean typically the antacids are designed for episodic release is what we're really really hoping for so typically the antacids may be used sometimes as sort of like when people go eat a spicy meal or something but somebody that has an ulcer or GERD we're going to be using one of the other drugs um, and let's talk about a couple of them and then I'll tell you the gold standard what most people have gone to so the anticholinergics primarily are going to block the muscarinic receptor acetylcholine stimulates secretion acetylcholine stimulates per, um, peristalsis so um, by blocking the effects of acetylcholine, that's done by the muscarinic receptor. What we see is we decrease mean secretion, which means histamine also causes gastric secretion, so we're blocking that. Uh, it also decreases ultimately the proton, or the hydrogen ion secretion, which is necessary to form the acid. Um, because that you're decreasing movement and you're decreasing secretion, it tends to promote healing. Um, the biggest, the drug we typically see used is propantholine. Um, in the past, we used things like atropine and some of the others. Um, they were not, their side effects were a problem. But really, we don't see a lot of colon, anticholinergics used because of the side effect profile. That is um, one of the big issues that we, we see. And um, so what happens here is basically um, these side effects, anything that's anticholinergic is going to show, you guys should know this, or have a good idea of what anticholinergic effects. They're gonna have dry mouth, the concern about um, you know heart rate kicking up, especially if somebody has underlying heart problems, concern about um, um, just generally drying up, maybe some vision issues and so forth. And again, with this one, we're seeing, um, this is the same figure you saw earlier. So the only thing I would say is you've got the cholinergic acetylcholine, causes calcium to stimulate protein kinase, which activates the proton pump. And so if we block that effects of acetylcholine, we're going to decrease that effect. But the other thing it's going to do is it's going to block the effects of histamine, the release of histamine. So we've seen these before. And um, the uh, cimetidine, timet, tagamet, which we talked about earlier, probably has the most concerns because of drug interactions and um, side effects. But the other drugs do not seem to have as much. All of these are available over the counter. Uh, Famotidine is Pepsid, uh, Nizanidine is Axid, Ranitidine is Zantac. I do have a note down here, since you guys might be prescribing Xanax, or I will give you an example just this last week. Somebody gave me a handwritten list of drugs, and um, the person was on Xanax, but they had written Zantac because the person had taken some ranitidine in the past. So don't confuse when your patients are giving you medication list. Um, you know, if they're using uh, H2 antagonist Zantac, um, sometimes they may think of it as Xanax or vice versa. So this should be a little bit of review. They decrease hydrogen ion secretion. So if you get decreased hydrogen ion secretion, that means there is less uh, hydrochloric acid that can be formed. Um, it, these, it's interesting that um, the H2 receptors um, really are involved in acid secretion only in humans. Um, and most animals don't have this. Um, these have been used primarily for peptic ulcer disease. Um, we do see it used for GERD, um, but um, they, um, inhibit the acid secretion that's mediated by gastrin acetylcholine food, um, activation of the vagus nerve in general. So what happens is by decreasing acid secretion, you basically get less pepsin and less pepsin secretion. Mucosa therefore can heal. And um, they, it has been used to prevent reoccurrence of ulcers. Um, typically we like to give them at night because that's where we see a lot of the um, gastric secretion occurring or where the acid is sitting around in general and again we like to tell people not to eat a heavy meal late at night for that reason side effects we've already concerned um, you know cimetidine is a big 3a4 inhibitor 
Um, for example, propranolol, diazepam, two couple of drugs that you might prescribe um, could cause those levels to go up. Typically, I try to tell people to avoid some editing. Um, it also um, can bind to the testosterone receptors that can decrease libido. It can cause gynecomastia, so it has an antiandrogenic. Um, that typically doesn't occur in normal doses, but sometimes these individuals, since this is available over the counter, they may dose more frequently, and so they may get at higher dosages. The big thing about most of these H2 antagonists are they are relatively safe. They're available over the counter, and cimetidine is the biggest um, problem of all of these drugs. All right, so let's look at what is probably the gold standard. Here's what, um, this seems to be the best um, drug, or the, or the drug of choice, preferably. And these are the drugs, this drug class of choice, I guess. These are the drugs that uh, we call proton pump inhibitors, okay? So this includes Nexium, Prevacid, Prilosec, uh, Protonics, Asics. So um, these are all um, Prozole uh, drugs, okay? Asomaprazole, Inosoprazole, Omeprazole, Tanaprazole, Raviprazole, okay? All of these are inhibiting the proton pump. And the reason, what they basically do is that hydrogen, potassium, ATPase, that's the proton pump. And what it does by inhibiting that pump, that prevents the parietal cell from secreting hydrogen ion into the stomach. If you don't have hydrogen ion in the stomach or you decrease the amount of hydrogen ion in the stomach, that means there's less hydrochloric acid. Okay, we have to have the hydrogen ion to form hydrochloric acid. This is the most effective way to diminish acid secretion, okay? All of, this, all of the other pathways go through this pathway. And so these drugs are considered the drugs of choice for not only peptic ulcer, but also for um, um, GERD, okay? And uh, let's go back a couple of slides, okay? So going back to this slide here, you see the, um, the sodium potassium pump down here, uh, which is the HPTS. Notice this, histamine goes to the potassium pump. Celecholine, potassium pump. Gastrin, potassium pump. So this final common pathway, uh, it makes sense. If you can block it, then it doesn't matter what the stimulus is, okay? So that's why it's so important, okay? So basically what you find is, this is another way of expressing it, is you have gastrin, you have histamine, you have acetylcholine, all can stimulate pump to increase hydrogen ion secretion, okay? If you block them, then basically that decreases hydrogen ion secretion. The amiprazole and uh, um, lansoprazole, those are prodrugs. They actually get converted to their active form. Interestingly, they get that, uh, that, uh, that um, conversion occurs in an acidic environment, makes sense. So once it gets down there, it's got to have the acidic environment. When it gets down there, it's an acidic environment. So basically what happens is they um, get activated down at that acidic area. So what happens is that once they get activated, these two compounds actually bind covalently, which is a sort of an irreversible bond, to this potassium hydrogen ion ATPase. Um, sometimes we've seen some hyperplasia occur with the gastric mucosa because what happens is that when it's blocked, the gastrin may try to continue to, to stimulate it and that's usually not too problematic. Um, differences between these drugs, for example, um, as Isomaprazole, that's metabolized a little bit slower, so its duration of action is a little bit longer. It may take a little bit longer to have an onset. Um, uh, pentoprazole was actually preferred in hospitals, mainly because there was an IV dosage uh, form that was available. I think there may be IV dosage forms of the other one, or a couple of the other ones now. Basically, these drugs all act similar. S side effects are very similar. It's just one of those things where that it is um, um, not to, um, uh, you know, it really comes down to maybe a little bit of pharmacokinetics difference. Some people 
what we saw is some of them became generic first, and so somebody may get that, but it really comes down to patient um, um, preference with regard to that. Okay. All right, let's do this. We've, this is a good place to take a break. This will be a short break, but it'll be our last break for this morning. And let's come back at five after the hour. And then we're gonna talk about sulcrophate and a couple of the other drugs, okay? The, the, any, the um, antacids, the antihistamines. Let's talk about this agent I've mentioned a couple of times here. Um, and by the way, uh, I think Aiden's gonna take the attendance window in, in just a minute. Um, so the protective agent is sulcrophate. I think of this as sort of a chemical Band-Aid. Um, what this is, is basically it is a, an aluminum salt and um, it contains sucrose. Uh, it's actually sucrose uh, octosulfate derivative. Um, so this one, this, this particular compound really doesn't uh, decrease um, the concentration of acid a, a lot, a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, what it primarily does is it basically, since it doesn't block the secretion, it's not as effective as either the antihistamines or either the proton pump inhibitors. A lot of times it's used in, um, in conjunction with them. So what it does is it basically forms a, a bond um, the, um, uh, with, the, um, with the tissue. And as I told you earlier today, the way that it basically is working is um, what it will do is basically um, form like a, a barrier. Um, if you've ever used this uh, stuff that uh, for cold sores or ulcers or things that is sort of like a, um, a gel that you put on your um, you know, on the cold sore and it keeps it, um, it helps it sort of heal and it takes, it basically keeps you from, uh, you know, being very more irritated. It's sort of like that. It basically binds to the edges of where the ulcer is and coats it. And, um, it doesn't bind so much to the other tissue. So it binds more so with where the ulcer is and coats it and therefore allows it to heal. So it's really more of a protective agent. So, um, and this is what this next slide says, is it basically complexes with the proteins where the ulcer is, forms a protective layer. Um, now it will, um, because it is sort of binding, it keeps the um, hydrogen ion from sort of back diffusing back into the tissues where it can, you know, uh, damage the tissues. Um, it will also bind to pepsin and bile salts if those are what's contributing to the ulcer, it does tie those up. But um, another thing it does do is it will suppress H. pylori infection. So a lot of times what we've realized with ulcers is we would treat the acid secretion, but since the H. pylori was there, we found that sometimes just treating acid secretion a lot of times didn't completely do that. But like I said, sucrophate is used in conjunction with other agents. It is rarely, um, I'm not aware of any instance where it's used alone because it just um, it's just not that effective of, of hitting everything. It's sort of used to sort of as a protective um, substance there. And that leads me into the other thing is, you know, for a long time until we discovered H. pylori was involved in the ulcers, pretty much what we were looking at is that um, um, we would treat the ulcer and it would just come right back or it would partially heal and not completely heal. So what we've done now is basically we recognize that in treating peptic ulcers, that we have to use an antimicrobial, something that will attack or get rid of that H. Um, pylori. So what we find is that whether the ulcer is in the stomach, which is referred to as a gastro ulcer or a duodenal ulcer, um, basically we know that H. pylori is there and uh, that creates, just continues to create an irritation. So what we do is that if we do everything to produce the antisecretion, the antihistamines, um, the proton pump inhibitors, pretty much what happens is that once we stop those, because the H. pylori there, um, it will basically, um, 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 it, it will basically um, just when we stop the anti-secretion, the, it comes right back. So what we have to use is the anti-secretion in addition to some sort of antimicrobial. And the idea is the antimicrobial is getting at the H. pylori and killing it.
So typically there's an antibiotic that's used in combination with these anti-secretory and that actually uh, works. Uh, and there's a couple of you is with the poll, uh, you know, I don't know, Aiden, I don't know if you've sent the poll out or, or not, but um, if you have a couple of people, it looks like they may have missed it. So if you'll just check on that. And there's the poll. So for those of you that um, were wondering, So with these antimicrobials, um, things that have been used is amoxicillin, which is an old drug, it's a penicillin, um, uh, clarithromycin, uh, metronidazole, which is flagell. Um, a lot of women have used that for um, some um, uh, other types of infections. Uh, Tetracycline has been used, but interestingly, a lot of people don't realize it, but Pepto-Bismol, uh, there's bismuth and Pepto-Bismol, and bismuth actually is an antimicrobial. But a lot of times we will see something like an amoxicillin or something like that used, which is designed to get rid of the H. pylori. Here are some examples of um, the drugs that can do it. Bismuth, which is in Pepto-Bismol. What it does is it basically breaks up the, the wall, cell wall of H. pylori. Um, when you start talking about bacteria, bacteria don't have cell membranes. We have cell membranes back to cell walls. Um, humans don't have cell walls. Uh, amoxicillin, it actually will break up the cell wall. Um, the clarithromycin and tetracycline, um, they're, they're basically um, used, um, they inhibit protein synthesis of the bacteria and that's how they, how they work. And then metronidazole um, basically is usually left and used when we have a strain that's there. But a lot of times um, amoxicillin, people manage that, manage that pretty well and, and works pretty well. As I mentioned earlier today, prostaglandins, um, what they can do is prostaglandins will actually inhibit um, the cyclic AMP um, that's stimulated with histamine. Prostaglandins can decrease acid secretion. They will stimulate muco mucus and bicarbonate. But the problem is, is we really don't have a good prostaglandin product. There is one called misoprostol which is not, um, we see it used more for stimulating um, uterine, um, stimulating uterine um, um, stimulation. And um, so, you know, it's just, we don't have a drug that is um, really good for standpoint of, um, um, without a good, with a good side effect profile. Misoprostol has got some, side effects, which just typically make it um, very difficult for it to use, you know, for it to use. So we really don't have a good prostaglandin agent uh, to use, which is why we use some of the, some of the other, many of the other drugs instead. Get the poll attendance here. So that sort of is where we're at with regard to treating these peptic ulcers. Um, just to sort of summarize, um, um, with regard to that is that um, typically um, it is um, um, a drug that is that we find we use antacids a lot that tends to be more of a temporary band-aid type effect when it deals with both for gastric we want to reduce gastric uh, reflux or duodenal or peptic ulcers what we want to try to um, basically come up with some um, mechanism to decrease acid secretion. Long term, we need to get rid of the H. pylori if it's an ulcer. So what we the, the go-to drug is the proton pump and um, uh, inhibitors. Um, so proton pump inhibitors. So that's going to be one of those um, uh, things that we're going to try to to target. Um, one of the things that we run into is that it is going to be very, very difficult uh, unless we get rid of the H. pylori for us to not have a recurrence. We use a lot of non-pharmacological therapy, but a lot of these drugs in general do, um, um, do work pretty well to decrease acid. But again, uh, it's a combination of pharmacological and then using something to decrease acid and then take care of the H. pylori when it's talking about ulcers, okay? Um, most of these drugs are tolerated pretty well uh, from a standpoint. The anticholinergics um, is probably the least tolerated, 
but the antihistamines uh, work pretty well. The proton pump inhibitors work pretty well. Uh, one other thing about the antacids is sometimes these antacids may tie up um, other drugs, uh, so you have to always be careful about it. Um, if somebody's especially using a lot of the antacids, sometimes they can interact with the, um, with the drugs to create a problem. Okay, so, okay, I think that must be the distortion, Arnold, may be from a standpoint of maybe a lag that's occurring here because the mic and everything, I just checked connections and I think it's there. And um, so, all right, let's, um, let's move on to um, another very brief uh, topic here is, um, this one is uh, pancreolipase. Uh, one of the things we have sometimes is that individuals suffer from malabsorption syndromes. Um, people with cystic fibrosis, uh, this can occur. But basically, with the pancreatic enzyme, uh, what happens is a lot of times during these malabsorption syndromes is the, is the food is not being broken down. Remember that the stomach starts breaking down um, with hydrochloric acid and the churning, which is a physical breakdown. Um, the other thing that we see um, that happens with um, digestion is a lot of the actual um, majority of the breakdown is going to occur with the pancreatic enzymes, the lipases, the proteases, and so forth. So sometimes with malabsorption is we're not having the pancreas producing enough of this. So uh, what people use is uh, one drug that can be used is called pancreolipase. This is actually a pancreatic enzyme replacement. So what you're taking is a lot of times people will take this right before they, they um, eat. And um, so the pancreolipase is designed to, um, to really break down, uh, help break down food to, the end of, to smaller components so that it is actually going to um, be able to be absorbed. Um, so this can be used for people that have these malabsorption syndromes, and sometimes we see this as associated with people that may have some sort of um, um, some sort of um, pancreatic problem. Uh, we see this used sometimes with um, pancreatic cancer, but people can develop a chronic pancreatitis, which is where that the um, um, the pancreas is inflamed and that inflammation over a period of time can actually um, create problems. Typically what they're going to do is that um, they will, this will be taken with each meal or each time they eat. So if they eat a snack or a meal, this is when it's uh, taken. Um, typically what we see is that um, um, there's some GI problems that occur that can, um, that's the main common things that we see with this. Um, the, um, um, so, I mean, a lot of times they can get constipated or diarrhea or something like that. And again, that's probably from uh, a combination of, the, of them taking, of the way the food's being broken down and the way they're eating in two, so that the, but the drugs can cause that. Now, another drug um, condition that we deal with is sometimes um, some of this irritable bowel syndrome and things like that. So one drug that has come out that starts, uh, this sort of an interesting drug is called Remicade. I like to use the term Remicade rather than Infleximab. Um, this drug is sort of uh, interesting because what this can do is when you see irritable bowel syndrome and some of these, uh, even some of the... Um, um, other um, inflammatory conditions. That's what this is really um, targeting is basically um, these inflammatory conditions. So um, what this drug does is it actually, you know, it's actually what we see it used for is Crohn's disease. We see it used for um, ulcerative colitis. We see it used for rheumatoid um, arthritis. Um, and even some uh, spondylitis and so forth. These are all, even psoriasis, these are all considered inflammatory conditions, okay? So with this drug, what it does is it actually involve, binds to a particular substance called tumor necrosis factor. A lot of times it is um, referred to as TNF. And um, what tumor necrosis factor is, it's really designed, it's part of your body's immune system, 
to that is designed to during your immune system what will happen is you get these t cells that are activated and these t cells will then attack and theoretically tumor necrosis factor is um, a substance that's designed to attack cancer cells and pathogens and so forth so on this diagram what you see is that um, when you get t cells that get activated by the immune system what will happen is they will then uh, release cytokines and this will cause proliferation of, um, of the T cells and also it will activate these uh, macrophages and these macrophages will then stimulate TNF alpha and the TNF alpha then attacks the cell. Well, the, what's happening here is apparently the immune system is, uh, there's an inflammatory condition. So when the immune system kicks in, it basically is going to, uh, it's acting as if there is a, um, an infection or something wrong, so it attacks that, that cell. So it's one of those things where that it's interfering with the immune system. So um, um, this has been useful, but one of the problems is when you interfere with the immune system, then you've got a problem with regard to the, um, to the concern. So for example, one of the serious, uh, this has got a black box warning on it, this is also used for arthritis and things like that. But the, the point becomes that since this is inhibiting your, your TNF alpha, which is part of your defense mechanism, the uh, black box warnings, um, there's, serious, um, there's a uh, thing about serious infection risk. So basically means that um, somebody may develop a serious infection <coughs> because the immune system is uh, interfered with. Also, there is concern about potentially uh, developing malignancies, cancers with this, because the tumor necrosis factor is supposed to be can uh, attacking cancer cells. So it is one of the concerns that you have to really watch out for when somebody gets put on these conditions. That there really has got to be a, um, um, a serious uh, consideration of, um, of infection. So a benefit risk has to be, uh, be uh, determined quite a bit. So, um, and then they have to be monitored very carefully for malignancies and infections and so forth. So this one is basically, uh, what it does is it interferes with the TNF alpha or the TNF um, tumor necrosis factor um, from binding to the cell membrane. By doing that, that sort of blocking the infection or the inflammation, I said infl uh, inflammation. So, um, so if you look down here, this is actually taken from an arthritis slide. So what typically happens is that um, the T cell basically activates these macrophages, which releases TNF alpha, which then will attack these uh, osteoclasts and the chondrocytes, and that produces inflammation and destruction. Well, so what these drugs like infleximab does um, is basically going to block this so that you don't get that um, inflammation. And so that's, um, that's a, a concern with this particular drug. So what it does is ultimately decrease inflammation. That's good because for Crohn's disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, and so forth, all of those are considered inflammatory diseases. Some may actually people may even consider them as, um, um, you know, basically autoimmune type diseases. So the net effect is they're inflammatory diseases, and the idea is we're blocking the inflammation. The downside is that it can depress the immune function. So the patient is going to be at risk for opportunistic infections and, uh, and malignancies. Let's do this next one, and this will be a good place for us to, to stop for you to take your little four question quiz, and uh, then we'll break for lunch, and you can break for lunch for then, okay? So another drug that's used for ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease is um, sulfasazoline. Um, this one actually, when you take it, it um, when it gets into the intestines, it's actually um, not only metabolized, but actually activated by the bacteria in your colon. And what this does is that this drug will decrease the inflammatory response since these diseases are considered inflammatory. They also inhibit prostaglandin synthesis. Prostaglandins are very involved in um, um, inflammation, and so that would block that. Now, with this particular drug, what we do see is that uh, sort of an interesting side effect is that it will turn the urine sort of an orange-yellow. Um, 
that is, um, uh, we always let, like to let the patients know that this can, can occur. Um, we see that uh, even people have had concerns or reported um, that they um, have a, um, uh, that their contact lenses have been stained. And so this drug is fairly well to uh, tolerated. There are several type things since it is a um, uh, decreasing inflammatory response uh, and inhibit prostaglandins. There is a possibility of um, um, you know immune uh, system being impaired, and typically people will see some um, um, GI effects, but we still have to watch them pretty close. There's no black box warning on it. But again, when you're dealing with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, those are pretty disruptive type diseases, and as a result, they are um, they are more likely. We we have to look at. Um, using these drugs that have a higher risk. We are looking at, you know, quality of life and the aspects of the disease. So there is, and these drugs are going to have a little bit more serious side effects. But again, with any drug, what you're going to do is you're going to um, um, uh, be, a, you, you need to be aware of any of these diseases that modify the inflammatory response or the immune system. There's always going to be some concerns. Um, Arnold, the um, thing is it doesn't really, um, what we do see is that um, it's not really um, a yellow, but we do see um, it tends to be more of a, um, uh, more of an orange color. And I'm not aware that it has, um, that the person's going to develop the, um, um, as bad as the, you know, where it looks like jaundice. I'm not aware of that, but I do know the, the urine does turn a fairly uh, significant orange yellow color. Okay, all right, so we're gonna uh, let Aiden put up the quiz. We will go over the answers to these quizzes, to this quiz uh, when we get back. We're gonna pick up on, we'll do this first and then we'll pick up on prokinetic agents and continue on with that. So take the quiz and then you guys head to lunch and I will see you back here at one o'clock and we will pick back up. All right, I'm gonna sign off here and um, Aiden, I'll sign back on uh, at one o'clock. Okay, doctor. I'll uh, keep the um, quiz uh, running for 10 minutes before I uh, close the call. Okay, thanks.